Hey guys, Britt here. Welcome to End Times Bible Prophecy. Make sure to hit the subscribe, like, and share buttons. Well, are we approaching the end game? Well, what end game am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about are we approaching the economic calamity that is certain to come? And no doubt, guys, it's only a matter of timing how quickly it will happen. It is a certainty that this will come. And to illustrate that, I want to take a look at this tweet right here by Lawrence Lepard. He's pinned this at the top of Twitter. He's had it up for some time. But this shows a chart of gross domestic product in the United States. So all the income generated in the United States and the national debt of the United States. And he says the blue line right here generates income to pay interest on the red line. See the problem? It's just math. And guys, that's the case. This is, this is basic math. This cannot continue on forever. You can't have this divergence that we see here going on forever. And what can't go on forever will not go on forever. So guys, this current economic system is coming to an end. Now, are we approaching that end in the near future? I'm going to make a case in this video that yes, we are by looking at a number of charts and seeing what's going on in the world today. So let's start with this one right here. This is from the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, this is official government data on M2. So basically this is the currency supply. We've looked at this before and I want to take a look at basically how this just goes straight up because again they just print this currency as they see fit but notice we had this little blip right here where it sort of levels off slightly instead of going straight up that little blip was the great financial crisis <laughs> right so this almost uh, destroyed the entire international financial system because the currency supply in the united states uh, stopped rising, increasing exponentially for a very short time and sort of flattened off and leveled off. And then, of course, we see here, oh, it's starting to go down, right? So what does that mean? If this little blip here led to the great financial crisis, what is that going to cause? And if we look at the same chart on a year-over-year -year percentage change basis, we see that it's actually negative. We did not see that during the great financial crisis. In fact, we haven't, this chart doesn't go back far enough, but there are charts that can be found that do go back far enough because you'll find the government tends to change these data sets so that you can't make those comparisons because they don't, they don't want the truth getting out. But the last time we had an extended period of time like this with negative year-over-year -year growth in the money supply, or they, what they call the money supply, I call the currency supply. Last time we saw that for this length of time was in the middle of the Great Depression. So, so that should tell you where we stand right now, what we're on the precipice of seeing. How about this? Let's take a look at this chart. This is bank credit. You'll see a very similar thing going on here because the extension of bank credit in the economic system we have is actually how they increase the currency supply. It's how more dollars are created. It's not really a printing press necessarily, just printing off dollar bills and throwing them out into the economy, but it's through the expansion of bank credit, loans being made, that new dollars are created. And as you see here, we have this straight up and then, oh, a little bit, not so much of an increase. Well, that was the dot-com bust crash, right? And then we had, oh, an actual somewhat of a decline there. That was the great financial crisis. We're starting to see the exact same thing happen here. I want to point out when we see something like this, where we see this exponential expansion, and if it slows down, it threatens to blow up the whole system. 
What would we call that when we have something that requires an ever-expanding pool of new people? And if that comes to a stop, the whole thing falls apart. Well, we call that a Ponzi scheme <laughs> or a pyramid scheme. They're outlawed for a reason, and yet, guys, our entire financial system globally today is built on a Ponzi scheme. It requires an exponential increase in debt and in currency creation in order to keep going. And the moment that slows down, the moment it starts to reverse, the entire system is under threat of implosion. So again, we can look at that same chart year over year in percentage basis, and we see this going negative for the first time since the great financial crisis. Really, the only time that's on record other than the great financial crisis. So that should, again, give us a, some sort of insight into where we stand right now. So let's take a look at another chart. Well, this is one we've been watching. This is the bank term funding program. So if you'll notice, for years and years, well, this was zero because it didn't exist, right? They, they created this out of thin air, conjured it out of thin air back in March 2023, so about 10 months ago, in order to basically, well, keep all of the banks in the world from collapsing. <laughs> Let's call it that. There were bank runs at Silicon Valley Bank, which felt, which basically went under. We had Signature Bank, First Republic Bank. Later, we had Credit Suisse. Had to, was forced to be bought out by UBS. So we had all these bank failures back in the spring of 2023 in real terms, not just in today's inflation adjusted returns, but even if you had this back in 2008, those, the failure of those banks constituted the second, third, and fourth largest bank failures in U.S. history. And collectively, their assets were greater than all the bank failures of 2008. So this program was created to basically stabilize the banking system and keep other banks from going under. So if we look at this on a, on a one-year chart, we can see how this came about in March as a result of that and how it got utilized. And it leveled off at around $100 billion. So it took $100 billion to backstop the banking system and uh, stop these bank runs that threaten to take down the entire U.S. banking system. Of course, that would mean the entire global banking system as a result of it. And we started talking a few months ago about how this started to go up in November when they had all of these glitches that were going on, glitches in Japan, glitches at the largest banks in the United States. Oh, there's uh, some, some ransomware attacks here. It was always a glitch. It was always a coincidence. And all along the way, each week we saw this going up. Well, now we sit at $167.7 billion. This is up 53% since November 1st and 18% since January 3rd. So we're seeing significant increases in this. Now, some people are looking at this and saying, oh, Brett, this is not a problem at all. This, this is not a sign of banking stress. What's going on here? is there is a difference between the interest rate that the Federal Reserve charges under this program and the interest that they would provide a bank on the reserves it parks with the Federal Reserve. And so there's this opportunity for banks to arbitrage that and they make the difference. So this is actually, they're taking advantage of this program to make money. It's not a sign of stress. And I would say, I find that uh, believable, I guess you could say, <laughs> but I'm not sold on that idea. And it does. And if I'm wrong, I will come out and say I was wrong. This is what was really happening. There was no bank stress. I won't hesitate to say that. However, we won't have to wait long to find out because 
Here we have this press release from the Federal Reserve from last Wednesday, January 24th. As part of that press release, they announced that effective immediately, so effectively, when, effective Wednesday, January 24th, they, to put it in simple terms, ended that loophole or arbitrage opportunity. So that means that every release of information we see going forward, because if we look at this bank term funding program, the data goes through Wednesday, January 24th. Every, every week they're giving us the data through Wednesday. So this Thursday night, they'll update that. And we would expect that if this is not a sign of bank stress to see this increase in usage of the program, that this would flatline right here. In fact, should go down, but at the very least it would flatline. But if this continues to go up in the weeks ahead, then that means there is definitely banking stress in play. And again, we won't have to wait even longer after that because as part of that same press release, the main purpose of the press release was to announce that they would end the bank term funding program effective March 11th. So new loans will no longer be made effective then. And that means one year, these loans are for one year. So anything that was taken out uh, at the beginning of this program will be due. So by June of this year, $100 billion has to be paid back by these banks that took out these loans. Now, in a previous video, I said, if they end this, it will crash the banking system, right? And so I don't think they're going to end it, right? <laughs> so it's, a, it's one of those temporary government programs that last forever. And that remains to be seen. I'm surprised they came out and announced this ahead of time instead of waiting. But we'll see if they actually do this. But I'm led to believe they might actually end it. Now, would they, would they simply end it and just let the banking system collapse? Because they would have to know that's what would immediately happen. But I think they have another plan in mind, and we see it in this article right here, which tells us, I think this is like blinking red lights telling us, uh, yeah, things aren't so, so well. We're going to see a banking crisis. They're preparing for it. It's from right here. This is from the Business Times. It says, United States prepares rule forcing banks to tap Fed discount window. Now, the Fed discount window is essentially the, the Federal Reserve is seen as the lender of last resort, right? So you hear that term talked about specifically with in regard to the Great Depression and backstopping failing banks. If, if banks are uncertain of the credit worthiness of other banks and other financial institutions. They're less likely to lend to them. So the lender of last resort when no one else will lend to you would be the Federal Reserve. And then you go to this thing called the discount window to get the cash you need to stay afloat as a bank, as a financial institution. But the, the problem with that discount window is historically, when you go to that discount window, it's a big sign telling everybody, hey, <laughs> over here, we've, uh, we're experiencing some big problems at our bank because we've had to go to the discount window. So when that happens, typically it makes that bank's stock plummet. It makes uneasy depositors say, you know, I think I'm going to move some cash over here to this other bank. So it can be to the detriment of a bank. Now, it doesn't always mean that that bank goes on to fail. Quite the opposite. However, you would see increased usage of the discount window in times of financial stress, in times like the great financial crisis or the COVID crisis, when you see great stress in the credit markets and in the banking system. And so you would expect to see banks using this discount window. So here's what they say here. They say U.S. regulators are preparing to introduce a plan to require that banks tap the Federal Reserve's discount window at least once a year. Well, why would they do that? Well, they tell us to reduce the stigma 
and ensure lenders are ready for trouble time for troubled times. So in other words, we want to muddy the waters. <laughs> you know, if every bank is going to the discount window, then when a troubled bank goes to the discount window, then uh, it won't raise any red flags because people will say, oh, well, I, everybody's doing that, right? <laughs> no big deal. The problem that I think that they're underestimating, because I think this is the Federal Reserve's plan to, hey, yeah, we can end this bank term funding program, and those troubled banks will just come to the discount window, and it won't be a problem because we'll force every bank to do it. Yeah, we're real smart. The problem is the bank term funding program was lending to those banks on underwater securities. So we talked about in the past there were 800 to 900 billion dollars in unrealized losses on bank balance sheets. In other words, they bought a bond, uh, let's say a government bond that yielded 1% and then interest rates went up, the value of that bond went down to say 70 cents on the dollar. Right, so that's an unrealized loss until they sell that bond, which they Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, First Republic Bank, they had to do that when depositors came to take out their cash and make those cash withdrawals. So they were forced to sell those at a loss. Well, the bank term funding program said, we'll give you 100 cents on the dollar for each of those. Temporarily, you pay us back a year from now when this crisis is passed and we're all good to go. The discount window, on the other hand, does not pay 100% on the dollar. And so I think they're going to find this inadequate when the time comes. And of course, they're saying uh, to ensure lenders are ready for troubled times. Well, why would you want them to be ready for troubled times? Well, because troubled times are coming. We've seen this in the past where the FDIC had that meeting in late 2022. We've got to prepare Got to tell the public everything's great. We want them to think it's great, right? We want them to have faith in everything. But then you look at what's happening behind the scenes, and we get more stories like, say, this one from Reuters. European Central Bank asked some lenders to monitor social media for early signs of bank runs. <laughs> right? Well, why would they do that? That's, that seems like an unusual request. Uh, it's just coincidence, right? It, it's just coincidence. <laughs> there's, there's nothing to see here. They're just, they're just preparing, just in case, right? There's, they aren't anticipating bank runs, are they? Are they? <laughs> Let this be your warning, guys. They're anticipating bank runs. So you might want to monitor your social media as well in order to prepare for what's coming. So if there's any doubt that we're getting closer and closer and closer to this end game about this. We've seen so far this year, this week, it says China is mulling rare intervention to arrest a $6 trillion stock market meltdown. So the Hang Seng, the Chinese stock market has crashed over 50% from its all-time high. It's down so far over 6% this year. They've put restrictions on short selling, which is something you always see in a stock market crash. The last time that I remember seeing this in the United States was in 2000, late 2008, and it started with financial stocks. I don't know if it extended to all stocks, but the big banks, they said, we need to end short selling, and they try to blame the short sellers for the crashing market. But guys, this just exacerbates the problem and makes it worse. Short sellers are good because, yes, they're selling stock and sending it down. But in a true free market where you have price discovery, if they send that too low, other people will say, hey, this is a great bargain. I'm going to start buying it. And they'll Put it at its true price and then once that stops going down well the shorts they have to buy that stock back to cover their position which sends it up even more but if you ban the short selling then you take out those short sellers buying back in later 
and you end up with a free falling market. So this is a sign of big time problems in China. We've covered in the past the real estate issues they're having there, the collapse of some of the largest real estate development companies in, within China. We're seeing foreign investment fleeing China at an unprecedented rate. So this is a big deal. China is the second largest economy in the world, according to most statistics. I believe actually it's third behind the European Union and the United States because they typically don't count the European Union as a total economy. But either way, it's a very large economy. And so when China is experiencing troubles, that's going to spill over into the rest of the world. And we've already talked about all the problems Europe is having. And we know about the problems the United States is having that we just talked about. So when you have all the world's top economies declining at the same time, well, you end up with a global depression, guys. And again, we talked in a previous video about when will we see that in the headlines. I think it's already here, but when will it become common knowledge? When will everyone know? We want to pay attention to this statistic right here. This is the U.S. Treasury two-year, 10-year spread, which historically indicates recessions. It has a 100% track record over the last several decades of predicting when recessions begin. And when this goes negative, it's called an inverted yield curve. Now, the inversion of the yield curve always precedes a recession. However, it isn't until it uninverts, meaning it goes back to a positive number again, that we would see that indicate, yes, the time is here. So to take a look at that, we could see historically from this what, what would happen, what we would expect to see happen. So guys, no doubt about it, <laughs> you know, we see this inversion back down here and then it comes back up and we have the great financial crisis. So we're on the brink of seeing that right now. When this goes positive and stays there for I'd say a few days or more, then start looking out for it's a matter of weeks at most months before this becomes common knowledge. We see most likely a stock market crash. Again, this indicates recessionary economic activity, not necessarily a stock market crash, but we have the stock market at all time highs and we have it at all time overvaluations, all time high overvaluations, similar to what we saw during the dot com uh, bubble and during the 1929 bubble. So I would expect if we see a recession take hold, everyone comes becomes aware of that. We begin to see layoffs from major companies. Then we would see the stock market plummet and all of this will build on itself. And I think this time, like other times, we're going to see big problems with the U.S. debt markets in the past. U.S. Treasuries, U.S. debt is where the safe haven where people fled to. We talked about this over the past week that this is considered the uh risk-free asset, right, is, is U.S. debt. Because it's anything but risk-free, as we know. So they can simply print more dollars to pay for it. So we're, we're seeing problems there. Will this be where everyone flees to? And if not, that creates a whole nother crisis in the midst of all of this. So guys, We've, we've talked extensively in the past of how this is all related to Bible prophecy, how this sets the world up for the release of central bank digital currencies, how those will be put forward as the solution to the major crisis that has hit the world. We'll talk more as that time comes about those measures and what they'll likely roll out. You know, I don't have the time to make a two-hour video right now, but this is... Um, the, we're seeing this right now. I don't think we have, but so much longer. I said in a previous video, I think by the end of March, and it looks like we're on course to see that, especially with the end of the bank term funding program, March 11th. We're probably likely going to see these bank runs and these 
crisis with several banks, just as we saw last spring, reoccur in tandem with the end of that bank term funding program. So we'll be on the look. I'll update you when they update the statistics on the bank term funding program and usage of that. So we'll see if that was really, oh, they're just taking advantage of it. There's no crisis to see here, right? It's no, there's no problem here. We'll see if that's true or not. If it is, I'll say, hey, I was wrong. But I also know this. The European Central Bank isn't saying to monitor social media for signs of bank runs just because they think it would be a, a pretty good idea, right? They're doing that because they anticipate bank runs in the very near future. So guys, prepare accordingly as we've discussed in the past. Don't let any of this stuff worry you. There's a lot of turmoil ahead. Jesus said the time preceding his return would be like birth pains, meaning they will. these types of events will increase in frequency and intensity as we near the return of Christ. So this should come as no surprise, but knowing that should give you comfort if you know Jesus. If your Lord and Savior is Jesus Christ, then you will have a peace that surpasses understanding no matter what's happening in this world because you've built your life on solid rock and no storm, economic, financial, no matter what it is, societal breakdown, it doesn't matter because you know Jesus and the storms of this world cannot move you. So guys, if you don't know Jesus, make sure you know him. So what do you think? Let me know. Leave your comments below. Make sure to hit the like, share, and subscribe buttons. And God willing, I will see you on Wednesday. Bye. If you want to learn more about the end times and Bible prophecy, make sure to sign up for my free monthly newsletter and get your copy of my free ebook, Seven Signs of the End Times. Just follow the link in the description to get your free book. Also, make sure to check out all of my books. Just look up Brit Gillette on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Apple iBooks, Google Books, Kobo, or anywhere books are sold. Thanks for watching today, and until next time, Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith.